moving on, our next talk then is from Bill Dewey from Taylor Shellfish, also uh, with the National Aquaculture Association in Stronger America through Seafood. And it's gonna talk about what USDA aquaculture needs from USDA mm -hmm. shellfish. So Bill, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Well, uh, like Jim, I wanted to uh, start off by acknowledging the great efforts here by USDA, the deep dive sessions and the webinar today and all your, your efforts to bring collectively your programs to bear on uh, helping grow our domestic aquaculture production. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, the shellfish industry uh, has a long history of working with different programs there at USDA, such as APHIS and ARS, NEPA, and the regional aquaculture centers. But it's been uh, inspiring to learn about some of these other programs that certainly we could benefit from as well. So uh, again, thank you for all of that. Shellfish aquaculture has a, a long history uh, in the United States. Uh, I don't have any good pictures of growing it in Washington, D.C. like Jim did. He won up me there for sure. But um, in Washington, where I'm based, in Washington State, where I'm based, uh, oysters were actually the first egg export from the state uh, in November 1849. The first oysters left the state for San Francisco to to uh, feed hungry gold miners that were striking it rich down there. So uh, the Taylor family that I work for uh, started growing shellfish here in Washington State in 1890 and, and uh, have grown in recent years to be a major producer of clams, oysters, and mussels. Uh, prior to the pandemic striking here at the end of last year, we were up over 700 employees uh, growing shellfish on about 14,000 acres of tidelands. Uh, and so major, major operation, the pandemic has changed that a bit, of course, like it has so many other businesses. But before I uh, launch into uh, shellfish needs from USDA, uh, since it's not in my slides, I did want to raise that, the, that to state the obvious that uh, the pandemic has really had an impact uh, on our industry across the board in the country. The, Shellfish industry relies heavily on the uh, food service uh, industry. So, so, so much of our products are sold in restaurants that when the restaurants shut down, it really had a, a huge impact. And, and uh, some of that's been revived as people have transitioned to cooking shellfish at home, but people, companies have pivoted to online sales and so on, but there's still a lot of people in the industry struggling and to the extent there's programs that can help with that you know, such as CFAP, CFAP2, the CARES Act, all of those, uh, the payroll protection programs all have been lifelines for the industry. And, and of course, that, that need continues today. So recognizing that I was asked to represent needs of the U.S., the whole U.S. shellfish industry, I reached out for some input, uh, heard back from a few, uh, and I wanted to give credit to Bob Rowe with the uh, East Coast Shellfish Growers Association. Bob gave me a, a very helpful list, which I've tried to incorporate into my slides here. But uh, So let's go ahead and, and dive in here. Uh, next slide, please. So similar to pinfish, uh, genetics and breeding program supports a, a key area of need. Uh, back one, please. Um, that's uh, um, an area where both the East and West Coast have benefited here recently with uh, the AR, USDA ARS. Uh, we're excited here on the West Coast. We just a week ago, uh, a new ARS geneticist started uh, working there in Newport, Oregon with our shellfish breeding program, which is great. But breeding for disease resistance and survival and production characteristics, uh, we're struggling here, particularly on the West Coast with impacts from ocean acidification. So trying to develop resistant strains that can tolerate the changing ocean chemistry conditions. Also feeling very threatened uh, by the OSHB1 uh, virus that has wiped out the industry, Pacific oyster industry in France and New Zealand and Australia trying to breed resilient oysters. Uh, so if and when it shows up here, we can respond. Uh, quantitative and molecular genetics and physiology, all components of the ARS program we're trying to, to build here. 
uh, sterile animal production, uh, natural triploids, chemical, and then uh, some recent work done by NOAA is particularly exciting on this single cell RNA sequencing to produce sterile animals, and then gene and environmental interaction. Next slide. Similar to, to uh, fin fish pest and predator control are challenges for us. One of the big ones in particular here in Washington state are burrowing shrimp. Uh, there's two species of them that will uh, burrow in the ground and undermine the oyster beds, so the oysters sink in and suffocate and die. And it's a huge issue for us in our coastal estuaries. Willapa Bay is credited with producing approximately 25% of the country's oysters, and it's being devastated by the burrowing shrimp. And in particular, in recent years, the industry has lost their there are pesticides that they've been able to use to control the shrimp. So we're desperate for new methods to control these critters. Uh, people are losing ground, hundreds of acres a year to the shrimp. Uh, and, and so it's having a big impact on the industry out here. But it's, that's a major, major concern for us. Certainly there's other pests throughout the country that affect shellfish growers though. Next slide. Predator control is another one. There's lots of things that uh, try to eat our shellfish and different ways that we try to armor up to protect against those with predator exclusion netting and different types of devices. Uh, diving ducks for us in the Pacific Northwest and also in the Northeast for mussel growers, uh, uh, scoter ducks here, eider ducks on the East Coast that will consume your crops uh, in a hurry. Uh, and then multiple species of crab that are constantly trying to eat your crops that you need to armor up against are just a couple of examples. Uh, next. Invasive species is a, uh, another concern. Uh, just a couple of examples here. Uh, the European green crab has had a devastating impact on the soft shell clam industry on the east coast. It's a, a relatively new invader to the west coast starting in San Francisco uh, back in the 1980s and has migrated up the coast. Uh, and more recently into Northern Puget Sound uh, onto some of our farms. There's a picture of me on the front page of the local paper there as we embarked on trapping efforts this past summer to start trying to document this topic of uh, infestation we had uh, have gotten there. But also beyond an, uh, animal invasive species, we've got plant invasive species, Zostra japonica in particular is a non-native eelgrass that is uh, taking over our clam beds in a number of areas and, and need methods of controlling that as well. So control of invasive species is a, is a need for the industry. Next slide. Uh, access to some of the crop insurance programs. Uh, USDA has been working with us uh, on the whole farm revenue program to try to make it more friendly to, to shellfish aquaculture, but definitely a need for the industry. There's been different efforts over the years, but to date, nothing really particularly effective that's worked, uh, but definitely a concern, you know, for uh, situations, whether it be disease or market interruptions or uh, freak weather that's not necessarily a named storm, which seems to be a criteria you have to meet for many of the USDA programs. Uh, this is just an example of something that hit one of our farms and a number of other companies in the same bay. Samish Bay with a you know just a freeze event where we had a, a major a big low tide that overlapped on a big freeze event and killed 30 to 40 percent of our crops across three year classes. We're still digging dead clams as a result of that today, and this has a huge impact on the, the bottom line for the farms. So next slide. Disease uh, the the APHIS programs there uh, have been outstanding, really important. We're excited about the. Uh, uh, the rewrite of the aquatic animal health plan, but we're grateful for all of the assistance we do get from APHIS. Uh, so research on various pathogens, looking to uh, probiotics, there's some excitement there about their use in the hatchery, uh, as well as potentially in, in depuration to facilitate removal of some of the uh, viruses or bacteria in, a, in the market ready product. Emerging pathogen surveillance, uh, industry education, uh, particularly like around the OSHV1 
so that people are tuned into the consequence of that and, and uh, looking for those mortalities. And then indemnity if we are forced to destroy crops because of the disease. So next slide. Bird interactions is something uh, uh, not unique to the finfish growers. Uh, um, and we have both positive and negative there. You, you know, we are, birds utilize the habitat we create with our crops. And, and, and so then we have interactions with those birds that become a concern, whether those are negative or positive. And so getting the science around that to understand that, to, to help inform the conditions on our permits. But also on the public health side of it, uh, particularly with floating aquaculture systems for shellfish, birds will roost on those systems and, and the feces from the birds, the guano from the birds contaminates the shellfish. So new regulations that have been passed by the Food and Drug Administration require us to have plans if we have uh, culture systems that attract birds to address that contaminant and, and clean up that shellfish before it's sold. So either are looking for ways to detract the birds from roosting on those systems uh, or find, helping us find ways to uh, modify the culture systems uh, to where we can clean the shellfish up before marketing, submerge those systems or whatever would be a help. And I know uh, uh, USDA has a, a group working on this now, which we appreciate. So next. Marine mammal interactions are another challenge for the industry. Uh, um, these are just pictures from actually from our farms in British Columbia where every year when the herring are running, the sea lions use our facilities to haul out and cause a lot of damage when they do this. this we had about 600 sea, sea lions on this farm for about six weeks uh, earlier this year. And, and this is an annual event, but it's not just sea lions. It's, you know, uh, in the Northeast, it's right whale interactions with buoys, et cetera, and concerns there that, that we need help with as well. So next and next. So uh, virus and bacteria elimination, you know, these are the animals we raise back one piece, yeah, are, are filter feeders and can pick up contaminants and become uh, unsafe to consume. So we have very strict water quality standards in our growing areas and in um, uh, some of the areas, if they're degraded water quality require depuration uh, in land-based purification systems before they can be sold. Uh, we have a, a Vibrio bacteria, a naturally occurring bacteria that causes gastroenteritis uh, or, or more serious with the species of Vibrio in the Gulf of Mexico can cause fatalities. So finding tools to uh, eliminate uh, that bacteria prior to selling the oysters and still leaving the oysters alive is a, a real goal of the industry. Uh, we think we're onto something, these pictures here of a, a brand new system that Taylor's built a temperature controlled uh, live holding system where we think we can drop that, the levels of embryo successfully before selling them. And there's research going on uh, at Oregon State University uh, using pro probiotics in similar systems to this to expedite that depuration of those bacteria. So it's uh, yeah, an area of need for the industry. Next. Uh, mechanization and production efficiencies, you know, as, as labor costs have gone up back when uh, have gone up, uh, this has become a real challenge for the industry. So finding both in our processing plants, uh, ways to um, make our processing more efficient, um, as well as on the farms, finding ways to mechanize the, the maintenance on the farms and the harvesting on the farms uh, are all critical. We're, uh, there just aren't industries typically here in the United States that have worked on this. It's slowly starting to change, but you know, if you come to our processing plant here in Washington State, it's full of processing machinery that we've imported from France and Italy where the industry is bigger and they've had government subsidies to help them develop some of that technology. And uh, that's things that we could use obviously here in the United States. So next slide. And the product and market development uh, is an area that the industry needs help with as well. Uh, Value-added processing, 
shelf stable product development. And this is an area since everything we sell is fresh and live, it hasn't lent itself to some of the product purchase programs that have resulted from COVID. You know, we don't have things that co can go into the food banks that don't need refrigeration or have limited shelf life. So finding shelf stable products that, that will help build resiliency for the industry, I think are important. And then identifying and accessing export markets uh, is an area where the industry could use help as well and, and take advantage of programs that, there at USDA. Next. This is a, an important area for us. Uh, research around the ecological interactions our, our uh, crops have. So we, where we farm these intertidal systems or shallow subtidal systems, our, our crops create uh, habitat that are then enjoyed by uh, either endangered species or species that are critical to endangered species. So we get caught up in um, uh, conditions related to that in our permits, but uh, you know, having science that understands that so those conditions are appropriate is really critical. Similarly, under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, there's requirements to protect essential fish habitat. So uh, again, that having accurate science that understands those interactions is really, really vital for our industry. Eelgrass is sort of the holy grail of estuarine ecosystems uh, for good reason. It's a valuable nursery habitat for so many species and our shellfish culture interacts with eelgrass. And, and so understanding uh, where those are positive, where they're negative and, and how best to mitigate them to take advantage of the positive effects, but also mitigate any negative effects we have uh, is an active area of research and research need. And along those lines, uh, uh, tools to do habitat equivalency assessments and, and tools to measure that. So uh, when you are impacting eelgrass and creating a different type of habitat, how, you know, how are the services uh, equivalent to uh, the eelgrass habitat that you're impacting? So next. Harmful algal blooms, Jim had that in uh, amongst the finfish. Well, it's a, definitely an issue for us as well. There's a number of uh, habs that will make shellfish toxic to eat. And, and so having uh, methods to de uh, early detect and monitor for them is critical, but also we're required to test routinely. And this has become a concern, not just with COVID, but just uh, you know, as states have limited resources and they're trying to grow new shellfish industries the industries can often uh, pay for the cost of that lab capacity. And, and so there needs to be some subsidy and some assistance there. Alaska is a great example of that. And they reached out to me when I solicited input for this talk today saying they're, they're desperate up there. It's a new young industry and it's very expensive to get your animals to the state lab. They have to fly from all the remote locations and, and they're looking at eliminating that lab capacity in Alaska just because of budgetary constraints, which would wipe out the whole industry in Alaska if they did that. So, um, and, and beyond just being a, a food safety issue, it, we're uh, learning recently that it's also likely the cause of a lot of our mortalities on our farms. There's, there are plankton species that will kill the shellfish as well. And we've experienced some major losses in recent years that uh, are likely attributed to these algae blooms. So another area of research need there. So next. Uh, access to commodity price support programs. This was one that Bob Rowe raised uh, that, that I wanted to include, you know, how other farm products have access to price support programs that help them deal when there's collapse in price or market interruptions or falters in demand. And, and these are programs that shellfish growers have typically been able to access. So uh, something to maybe look forward to there. Next. Uh, water quality is another uh, area of need for the industry. Uh, microbial source tracking, you know, because our shellfish, uh, if there's water quality impacts, we have to monitor for fecal coliform bacteria. And, and uh, when it exceeds a certain level, the growing areas get closed down. So then you go 
off trying to find the sources of that fecal coliform, which can be any warm-blooded animal in the watershed, essentially. So using microbial source tracking is a valuable tool to try to pinpoint what the source is. Uh, ag VMPs that work for terrestrial farmers and achieve Clean Water Act water quality standards uh, is an important area of work, uh, both for the terrestrial farmers and, and our, our marine shellfish farmers. And along those lines, the nutrient management, manure management, whether it be dairies or others, uh, impacts our growing areas as well. So uh, next, uh, actually, before you go on uh, to the next slide, I just wanted to raise a couple of points that I hadn't had in bullets, but watching the earlier presentations, I, I wanted to call out because they're important to shellfish. Andy mentioned them in his presentation under goal three was one was uh, traceability. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a really important aspect of our national shellfish sanitation program. And with the new proposed uh, traceability rule that FDA's uh, got out for public comment right now, some things may be changing there as well. And, and so technology and systems that are emerging uh, for food traceability across the ag community that we might benefit from. Uh, that input would be welcome. And then under goal four, uh, Andy raised the user conflicts, which is also a huge area. You know, the social science, the gain of social license uh, for shellfish growers, where we're, so many of us are located in the near shore in front of residential areas uh, or in uh, recreational boating or fishing areas, the user conflicts are a big issue for us. So finding ways to address those. And also it came up in Andy's talk, uh, uh, assistance for implementing the uh, different state initiatives. So in 2011, uh, NOAA launched a, a national shellfish initiative, which uh, we implemented here in Washington state with the Washington state shellfish initiative, but several other states and regions around the country are doing shellfish initiatives as well. And it's been a great effort. It's really inspired a lot of growth in the industry and to the extent that USDA can help uh, with the implementation of those shellfish initiatives. Uh, I think that would be a great asset for the shellfish industry. And um, if we have time, Peggy, I just have a number of slides. I just wanted to click through quickly just to show people the diversity of the shellfish industry around the country. So you can just kind of speed through them here. If I see something I want to speak on, I'll stop you, but go ahead, just click. Gulf of Mexico there. This is my personal, I have a clam farm of my own in Northern Puget Sound. And these are pictures from my farm here. Mechanized clam harvesting I developed there. That's a tulip bulb harvester. Next. Planting oyster seed here. Next. Dewey duck farming here in Washington state. It's a six year crop for us. Oysters and eelgrass. Again, that interaction I talked about earlier. Next. Oyster long lines, we do this if the ground's too muddy uh, to grow oysters on the bottom, we'll suspend the crops up off the bottom. Next. Another popular method for growing oysters here in the Northwest are these oyster flip bags that tumble up and down with the tide. Mechanical harvest to choose both on the east and west coast to harvest oysters off the bottom. Processing oysters, you know, it's been forever a manual process with a knife and people cutting oysters out. Any ways to mechanize that uh, in the future would be helpful. Next. All manual grading of oysters. Muscle farming. Again, with the mussels, just keep scrolling here, Peggy's fine. Um, a lot of the equipment that's being used in the industry is being custom built by the industry because there aren't manufacturers here to do that. So all these are custom built barges and so on. Worcester seed. 
and harvest, moisture harvest. Again, customized machine for oyster harvesting. And this is up in Alaska, suspended culture, deep water culture hanging from buoys. And that's it. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, for showing us so much uh, in pictures of, of shellfish aquaculture. Bill, I have a couple of questions that uh, have been entered that uh, if, if you wouldn't mind addressing. Um, so the first one, question for Bill Dewey, can the USDA help shellfish growers combat nuisance seaweed interactions? Well, I would hope so. I mean, it's definitely, definitely a challenge for us. I mean, that's another one I didn't have in my slides, but uh, you know, on our, our crops and gear, in fact, one of the pictures on my clam farm, you could see it looked like I was growing seaweed instead of clams. The, the out macroalgae that grows on our cultural equipment, which will suffocate and kill our crops is an issue. So we'd like to find ways actually to harvest that. In fact, we've got some grant proposals going in to find ways to uh, harvest the macroalgae that grows on our crops and do something useful with it. But, uh, I'm guessing USDA would have programs to help, help help us with that. Okay, thank you. And then one more question. For burrowing shrimp, with the loss of imidacloprid and carbaryl prior to that, are there any options in the pipeline that need advocacy and what other alternative approaches are being taken for management? Yeah, so, so so I'm less familiar with all the details on that because tailors have, have departed from that, the pesticide program. But there is an active group working with the state of Washington uh, to identify alternatives. Uh, some of them may be chemical or mechanical, et cetera. Uh, obviously, tailors are working on that, trying to find alternative systems for growing oysters around burrowing shrimp or alternative non-chemical means to control shrimp, definitely a huge need uh, for the industry and, and I'm happy to connect people, whoever asked the question, I'm happy to connect them up with the right people to get those answers. Okay, great, thank you very much, Bill.